any girl of any priest, if she became a prostitute, like a religious prostitute, that was wrong. And God is telling the priests even here, not just the daughters, but the priests, don't allow this to happen to your daughters. Protect your daughters and keep them safe because they are holy, they are set apart just as you are. And so you need to protect your own daughters and your entire family as well. Hey, faithful listener, grab your cup of coffee and experience the Bible in a way you never have before. P40 Ministries is a podcast that goes through the Bible cover to cover. It's an awesome narrative that focuses your mind and prepares your heart for God to speak. So join your host, Jen, for a biblical podcast that's hilarious, informative, imaginative, and fun. The P40 Ministries podcast. Listen now as we go through the book of Leviticus. Hello, faithful listeners. Thanks for tuning in this morning on this beautiful Friday morning to the P40 Ministries podcast. And hi, my name is Jen. I'm the host here and just uh, looking forward to the weekend. I'm really looking forward to the weekend. I'm going to be able to actually hang out with my husband for a change. <laughs> oh, he was gone for like two weeks on a trip. So I'm I'm excited for him to be back and to hang out with him. And also I'm excited because the daffodils are blooming in my backyard and in the woods around my house, just daffodils everywhere. I love it. They're so nice smelling. I think daffodils are like one of the nicest smelling flowers in my opinion. They smell quite nice. But all right, let's go ahead and talk about Leviticus chapter 21 verses 1 through 9. I'll be reading out the W.E.B. this morning. Feel free to take a moment to grab that cup of coffee or your cup of tea. And let's go ahead and dive right in. Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, A priest shall not defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives that are near to him, for his mother, for his father, for his son, for his daughter, for his brother, and for his virgin sister who is near to him, who has had no husband. For her he may defile himself." He shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. They shall not shave their heads, or shave off the corners of their beards, or make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God, and not profane the name of their God, for they offer the offerings of Yahweh made by fire, the bread of their God. Therefore they shall be holy." They shall not marry a woman who is a prostitute or profane. A priest shall not marry a woman divorced from her husband, for he is holy to his God. Therefore you shall sanctify him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, Yahweh, who sanctify you, am holy. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the prostitute, she profanes her father. She shall be burned with fire." A nice verse to end off there. She shall be burned with fire. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in a second. So verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all related here. Because it's talking about the priests. Not the high priest, I should add. But the priests. So any priest that would become a priest would have to follow these rules. So basically, God is teaching priests how to be priests. And this is the second time uh, God has done this, or rather the third or the fourth, really. Because there's been rules for priests in the past, especially with how they have to do stuff and the different ways that they have to take care of God's sanctuary and the ways they also have to um, do the offerings and the sacrifices and stuff like that. But now this is talking about their personal lives, kind of, whereas before it was not necessarily going into the priest's personal lives. So these are rules for how a priest should act outside of the temple. 
if that makes sense, in their own personal lives. And it's, it was important for the entire family to behave in a priestly way, even though the priest would be the man of the family, his entire family as well would have to follow like priestly rules and set themselves apart and be holy because they all had this job to do. They all had this job of making sure that they were uh, being leaders in a sense, a leading family that would teach other families how to follow God. So all of them, both the wife and all the kids and the sister and anybody else that was in the clan of the priest or the family of the priest would have to make sure that they're following like a holy way of living because they were role models for the entire congregation of Israel. And this is kind of what God is saying here, that even though, yes, the priest has the main responsibility of doing everything, his family also has a responsibility and they need to also conduct themselves in a certain way to show other people how they're supposed to live. I mean, this is no different for us nowadays. Like, this is seriously no different. We are supposed to live a certain way as Christians, as Christ followers, because we shine our lights. And in a way, this is the priestly family shining their light to all of the people of Israel. So it says that a priest shall not defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives. So if you read a verse in Numbers, I think it's in like Numbers 22 or something like that. I'm not quite sure. But in Numbers somewhere, it talks about how if a man even walks into a tent that a man died in, a man or a woman died in, then the man who walked into the tent where the dead person laid would actually be quote unquote, unclean for a period of seven days. Obviously, this makes a lot of sense from a medical perspective that anybody handling a dead body, especially back in these days, it was rather unhealthy to do. So from a medical perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense that uh, somebody would be considered unclean or ceremonially unclean for seven days. And this was a way to... Um, ward off any kind of disease maybe that would have caused the person to become sick and die possibly. I mean, there was many, many reasons for this. But God says that if a person even enters a tent where a dead man is laying, then that man, even if he doesn't even touch the body, that man or that woman is considered to be ceremonially unclean. So a priest couldn't even go into the tent or even be at the funeral of somebody who had died if it was not their closest relatives. So it had to be a super close relative. It couldn't be like a cousin even, or even an aunt or an uncle. It had to be like that family, like a brother. It says a virgin sister, somebody who does not have a husband, a son or a daughter, and for his mother or for his father, and also probably for wives, even though the wife is not mentioned it's just very likely that a wife was considered to be part of this as well. But yeah, I mean, so the priest could only go to the funeral of a person that was like his nearest relative. So why was this in place? Well, for the first reason is because the priest needed to avoid being ceremonially unclean as often as he possibly could. But secondly, it was not the priest's job to oversee funerals in any way because a priest was a life giver. A priest was an intercessor for the people. So he didn't need to be at funerals. And, and we think of that nowadays, at least I did. I think of that as kind of odd because preachers and priests nowadays always oversee funerals. <laughs> but in this day and age, God was saying it was not the priest's job to oversee funerals because priests did not need to, A, become ceremonially unclean for every uh, person that ended up dying that was not their relative. And secondly, you know, they had a job to do. If they were ceremonially unclean all the time, they obviously couldn't do that job as well as they needed to. And then thirdly, they were supposed to be life givers. They weren't supposed to be associated with death. So that was why God kind of removed the priests in this time period away from funerals. But he does go on to say, God goes on to say that a priest does not need to mourn 
for his family members in the same way that the pagans do. We already talked about some of this stuff. They shall not shave their heads or shave off the corners of their beards or make any cuttings in their flesh. That was all pagan stuff. That included tattoos as well, just throwing that in there. You know, that was that was all pagan stuff that the people would do to mourn the loss of the uh, dead relative that they had. And God was saying the priests should not be associated with any kind of pagan customs like that. And it says right here why they shall be holy. Holy, once again, means set apart. The priests need to be even extra set apart <laughs> from the typical person because the, the typical person, People, I mean, don't forget, this was all rules for priests. The typical person could attend a funeral or, uh, you know, bury their relatives or their cousins or whatever. But for the priest specifically, he needed to make sure that he was not constantly around dead bodies all the time so that he could um, actively fulfill his job and his role as the priest. And he also needed to make sure that he was not doing the pagan customs. But the pagan things here, this was not just for the priest. We talked about how nobody in Israel was supposed to do this stuff. Because all of Israel was supposed to be set apart as holy. So no one needed to be mourning the same way that the pagans mourned over their dead. And that brings me to a verse in, um, I'm talking about Paul a lot, I realized over the past like two weeks. I think I've mentioned Paul in almost every single one of my podcast episodes. But for some reason, a lot of what Paul talks about, I feel like relates to the Old Testament. But anyway, Paul says something about how since you and I are set apart as different as, uh, you know, followers of Christ, we shouldn't mourn over our relatives the same way that those who have no hope do. Isn't that an interesting statement? And I mean, that's that's kind of a hard concept for me to grasp, but I've never lost anybody, thank, thank God. I've never lost anybody other than my grandma who has been super close to me. But what Paul is saying there is that if we know that that family member had Christ in their lives, and that they're in heaven, we don't need to mourn the same way that um, somebody who has no hope of that will over their family members. We can mourn differently. We can mourn almost in a way that we know, even though it's sad and it's hard and terrible at the time because that person was taken away from us, we can mourn in a way that we know we're going to see them again someday. And so it's just a little bit different. And I feel like that almost correlates here with a lot of this like funeral stuff that we're talking about in Leviticus. It's just the priests were supposed to mourn a little bit differently. In fact, all of Israel was supposed to mourn differently as people who had hope in God and not as the pagans did who had no hope. They didn't know where their family members went after death. But the Israelites, if they followed God's law, they knew where their family members would go. But here in verse 7, it talks now about marriage rather than funerals. It says, A priest shall not marry a woman who is a prostitute or profane. A priest shall not marry a woman divorced from her husband, for he is holy to God. So any woman that uh, in some way was married or was a prostitute, a priest specifically was not supposed to marry um, a woman like that. It does not mention widows here. I just want to throw that out. So I don't know if that was a rule or not, if a priest could marry a widow. But overall, a priest was not supposed to marry a prostitute or a woman who was divorced from her husband. And so this kind of just goes back to that whole thing of staying set apart for God and showing the people what a correct way of living was. Though I should mention, once again, this was the rules for the priests. And in fact, it never says in scripture that an Israelite person was not allowed to marry a prostitute. Otherwise, Hosea would have been sinning when God told him to go and marry a Gomer, who was a prostitute woman. So it, there's no rule specifically that 
a um, Israelite man can't marry a prostitute, especially if she, you know, obviously changed her ways and was not a prostitute anymore. God always offered forgiveness. And we we know of several prostitutes in scripture where God offered just so much forgiveness towards them. And they did, in fact, um, change their ways. The one I'm thinking of specifically is actually Rahab. But we'll learn about her later. But anyway, a priest should not marry a divorced woman or a prostitute, for he is holy to God. And then in verse 8, this is God talking to Israel. He says, Therefore you shall sanctify him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, Yahweh, who sanctifies you, am holy. So this is the whole reason why these priests had to follow these rules. Because they were holy, they were set apart for the people. And they were also set apart for God to do these things for God to take care of the the temple, the place where God lives, all that stuff, and to make sure that it was maintained and running consistently, but also to be the leaders of the people and to offer God's forgiveness to the people through basically just intercessing for the people so that the priests could go and talk with God and God would forgive the people because of the priests who were holy and set apart. And so here in verse 9, the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the prostitute, she profanes her father and she shall be burned with fire. This goes back to how the whole family, even the daughters, which by the way, back in these days, daughters were considered like nothing. And so God is saying that the daughter has a special role to play. She's not supposed to go out and play the prostitute. She has to be a holy and set apart person because if she does play the prostitute, she actually profanes her father. So she has a really, really significant role of being part of the family, the priestly family. And so if she goes out and plays the prostitute, it says that she should be killed. And this is the only time, I was actually researching this, this is the only time that prostitution was actually uh, punishable by death that I know of in scripture. Well, unless the prostitute actually had sex with a married man, then at that point, both the married man and the prostitute would be punished by death also. But I think the main reason for this particular rule, once again, goes back to those um, the cultist prostitutes. And by the way, there were male cult prostitutes as well, I found out. I was reading... Um, when I was researching this, I was reading something in 2 Kings that talks about the male cult prostitutes that were in God's temple. And I mean, there were women there too, but yeah, I mean, God knew what was going to happen. He was like, don't let your daughters become pagan prostitutes. And what that was, if you haven't listened to any of my uh, previous podcast episodes about the pagan prostitutes, they were actually considered like religious prostitutes and they would live in the temple of God and these men and these women could go and like buy a prostitute or buy some time with a prostitute and become like, I don't know, more religious through this act of prostitution with either this male or this woman. And yeah, that was really, really popular. And even now, if you look at cults, like just cults nowadays, lots of times there's a lot of just really sexual things happening in those cults. So even nowadays, I mean, sexual things and religion are like still very, very closely connected. And so God is, is telling his people back in these days who had like no clue that it was wrong to you know, have a prostitute and you weren't going to become religious through that prostitute, God is telling his people, no, this is wrong. Don't do that. And so any girl of any priest, if she became a prostitute, like a religious prostitute, that was wrong. And God is telling the priests even here, not just the daughters, but the priests, don't allow this to happen to your daughters. Protect your daughters and keep them safe because they are holy. They are set apart just as you are. And so you need to protect your own daughters and your entire family as well. <laughs> 
This was a really fun passage to research. I kind of jo- enjoyed going into like the history of uh, the priests and stuff. It was kind of interesting to like learn about some of this stuff. But yeah, hope you guys learned something or at least something new about Leviticus chapter 21 and just some roles that the priests had. I think the one that really stuck out to me, I would guess, is just how the priests were supposed to be focused on life. And like, I just thought that was super cool because that is exactly what uh, Jesus does for us as he gives us life. And obviously now he is considered our high priest, yours and mine. He is our high priest. So yeah, I think that's the one that, that stuck out to me the most. But anyway, guys, I just hope you have a really great weekend and that you join me Monday bright and early for another episode out of Leviticus chapter 21. And we'll be finishing up by talking about the rules for the high priest rather than just the priests like we talked about today. We'll see why the high priest is a little bit different and even a couple extra rules that the high priest is supposed to do that um, that just the regular priests don't necessarily have to do. But all right, friends and faithful listeners, have a fantastic weekend. Happy listening and God bless. <laughs>